Welcome to the Sri Lankan Understanding, a media platform aimed at exploring the path taken by Sri Lanka, an island in the Indian Ocean which has experienced a vibrant past and has the potential for a bright future. We're talking today about power sharing, missed opportunities, contemporary challenges and concept of how power has been devolved, problems around it, the controversy that arises as a result of it as well. To speak to us today, we have Dr. Kalana Senaratna, who had his tertiary education at the University of London, University College London and the University of Hong Kong. He has worked with the late esteemed judge C.G. Viramantri. He has worked with SCOP, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, with the Social Scientists Association and is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Peradeniya. Welcome Kalana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, George. Why is it controversial? Why do we talk about power sharing and also attach controversy to it? Is it controversial? Well, uh, I'll first start with what this entails, Sir George, what this particular demand entails. Uh, when we talk about power sharing, uh, the power that is that has been discussed here is the power of a particular group of people, a community, to uh, decide the fate of their uh, uh, that particular community. Uh, it's about uh, determining the uh, political, economic, social destiny of that particular group. And uh, it is for this particular purpose that in politics we talk about uh, the topic of power sharing. Now, what happens generally is that uh, in, in states, and this is where all this becomes controversial. Uh, in, in states, you often get, or almost always, uh, you get a majority community which has uh, power. And you also get different minority communities in that particular state, uh, numerical minorities, for example, uh, who do not have power and who demand power. So at the very root of this particular concern that we have about power sharing is this uh, reluctance of a majority to give away certain powers that they already have and the uh, demand that is made by other groups uh, for more power. Uh, this becomes even more complex because of the fact that uh, these groups ultimately are groups which are attached to a particular ethnic, religious, linguistic identity. Uh, so therefore, um, uh, all these groups in some way uh, want to sort of cherish, uh, want to nurture, want to uh, protect the, the uh, uniqueness of that particular identity. Uh, some would want to maintain their superiority uh, that they've attained because they are a numerical majority. Uh, others would uh, want more power to assert themselves, to assert their particular identity uh, for various different reasons. So because of all this, uh, something that looks quite ordinary, something that sounds quite simple, sharing of power, becomes an extremely uh, complicated matter. Understanding what the problem is, is, is easy. Uh, but when you try to address this particular issue uh, in, in a context where you get um, different kinds of you know, ethnicities, religious communities, uh, linguistic communities and so on, uh, things become a little difficult. But I think the, the, the point that I would like to stress here is that uh, a lot of people say that these are complicated matters, uh, it's, it's very difficult to address them. All that is true. But I think at the root of it, there is this very simple issue of whether a particular group wants to share power uh, or whether it does not want to share power. So that's where the controversy arises from. And that's also where we begin to understand from independence to date. If you just look mm -hmm. at that 70-year-old period, 70 year -old period mm -hmm. uh, we've seen so many attempts being made, demands being made for the sharing of power and attempts being made to share it. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of some of the major landmarks that you've seen, or that we can count from then to now. Mm. Certainly, we, we focus a lot on 1987. Mm. 
and we talk about the Sri Lanka Accord. But there have been numerous other instances where demands have been made for power to be mm. shared with from the centre to the periphery mm. and uh, demands f uh, for it to be devolved accordingly. What are some of these major landmarks, Kalana? Uh, historically, George, I think we can go back to the 1920s if we want to really think about uh, how this particular uh, demand for power sharing, how the discourse on power sharing uh, started. Uh, and one thing that needs to be said, of course, is that there are different histories when it comes to this topic of power sharing. But one history uh, that I always uh, would go back to uh, is the history where discussion about power sharing uh, was, was initiated by uh, Sinhala politicians, or politicians who belong to the Sinhala uh, Buddhist community. Um, one such person was none other than uh, S.W.R. Bandar Raika, as a young politician in the 1920s, uh, mid-1920s, uh, giving a few lectures in, in Jaffna in particular. Uh, he came up with this idea that uh, a federal solution was uh, the best solution uh, for a particular problem that he saw in Sri Lanka, uh, the problem of uh, divided, uh, a problem of the divided polity, uh, divided communities. And it's very interesting to uh, sort of go back to that particular writing or that series of writings of S.W.R. Dibanda Naika because he perhaps understood that uh, the communities uh, in Sri Lanka were actually uh, divided and, and since uh, colonial times. Uh, there was, uh, it, was, it, it was very difficult for these people to come together under one single nation. Um, so he was someone who, who saw that particular problem. He also said that it would be a very rash man uh, who would think that these changes, these differences that different communities had would go away that easily. So he understood the importance of a federal solution. He was not talking really about the Tamil national problem as we understand that today. Uh, but he was talking about a particular point and it's very, uh, it's quite unfortunate that 30 years after that, uh, about 31 years after he wrote those articles uh, in 1957, uh, he basically tells the Tamil leaders that he's unable to talk about the federal solution. Uh, that's one part of the history. Then there is also uh, the demands that were made by the upcountry Sinhalese. Uh, the Kandyan National Assembly, which uh, talked about the importance of a federal solution. And what's interesting there, and this was done in the 1920s uh, again, before the Donomo Commission. What the Kandyan National, National Assembly said was that uh, we are a different nation and uh, there should be a federal structure uh, in, 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 Sri Lanka, in Ceylon. Uh, and that is the only way in which these different identities can be safeguarded. Uh, the lesson there, of course, is that uh, it need not be the minorities always uh, who are demanding uh, power sharing. Uh, it can be a group that feels itself uh, to be a threatened community, its identity being threatened, uh, its uniqueness being threatened uh, in a sea of Sinhalese. Of course, the upcountry Sinhalese were finding it a bit difficult to maintain their identity. So you get, you get uh, the Sinhalese making those demands. And then you come to the Tamil people uh, making those demands, especially in the 1940s, 50s, uh, and history sort of goes on. Uh, and we'll come back to that point yes. in terms of talking about it from 48 onwards, and of course, looking at how we have taken a trajectory. So we come back to that and also internal and external influences within the concept of power sharing when we come back. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan Understanding. We are in conversation with Dr. Kalana Sena Ratna and talking about the concept of power sharing. Kalana, before the break, you mentioned incidents, developments, major landmarks up to independence. If you look at it from 48 onwards, what would you identify as some of the key moments where we have tried maybe and failed, at least tried to share power? Um, perhaps the first, uh, George, is in the 1950s. Um, and there's a long, I mean, story to that, but, but uh, 
Uh, what happened was, uh, as you know, SWRT Bandar Naik uh, come into power, um, Sinhala only being the official sort of language policy at that time. And then he uh, talks about power sharing with the Tamil political leadership, and you get the Bandar Naik Chalunagram Pact as a result. Uh, that was perhaps one of the uh, sort of major instances in post independence Sri Lanka uh, or Ceylon, um, where an opportunity of some kind arose uh, to, to negotiate this matter and, and uh, introduce something like regional councils uh, in Ceylon. Uh, that failed, uh, and then you get uh, 65, the Dudley uh, Shalonaigam uh, Pact. Again, something that, that failed. It was um, not as uh, perhaps sophisticated as the uh, Bandanaika Shalonaigam Pact, but still uh, something could have happened, but uh, did not. Then, of course, uh, you get uh, the developers in the 1980s. Uh, where uh, there is the introduction of the 13th Amendment uh, to the Constitution. Uh, and since then, I think uh, the major landmarks, I mean the major, major instances when uh, some significant development could have taken place, uh, one is uh, the 2000 uh, draft Constitution, uh, where there was, I think, a real opportunity to uh, agree on a particular constitutional document, a new constitution, which granted more powers to the peripheral units in the country. Did not work uh, because of uh, uh, the opposition being reluctant to sort of uh, uh, accept the, the, the draft constitution. Uh, thereafter, there have been instances when uh, constitutional reform and, and power sharing in particular were discussed. Uh, we know the APRC process in 2006, seven, that period, during the time of the war. Uh, then more recently, 2015 to 2019, the constitutional reform project. Now, one thing that needs to be said, uh, George, is that uh, we talk about missed opportunities, and that also is, is you know, these are words that can be sort of uh, uh, looked at a bit more critically. Uh, we talk about opportunities, but opportunities for whom? Uh, if you ask the Sinhala nationalist majority, these were not really opportunities. They were, these were very problematic moments for them. Uh, if you ask the Tamil people, the Tamil nationalists, for example, uh, you know whether these were opportunities, they would say, well, uh, they're not really opportunities because uh, there was no opportunity in the first place because the, the, the discussion was such that it was dominated by uh, the Sinhala nationalists. Uh, so uh, I'm a bit skeptical when talking about opportunities in that sense. but. Uh, to put it in, in very broad terms, I mean, these were perhaps instances when uh, a, a better discussion about uh, power sharing uh, could have uh, taken place. Uh, some sort of compromise could have been reached, uh, but that did not happen, and that's what's unfortunate. Extremely. When we look at influencers, and you've talked about influencers within the country, if we look externally, yeah. Uh, from the region maybe and beyond. What would we adduce to being the reason for their involvement? And of course, we can go into uh, geography, history and things like mm -hmm. that in terms of Sri Lanka. But the vested interests maybe, um, whether it has been with regard to populations in their own countries mm -hmm. and demands within their own countries, mm -hmm. pressure that they are under um, uh, in those countries. What do you think are the factors that have contributed to that? I think we are talking here about uh, Indian influence largely. Um, and uh, India's, I think, uh, perhaps intervention uh, in, in, in the internal affairs of Sri Lanka uh, has a lot to do with uh, the circumstances that the central government of India uh, is faced with. Um, and this goes back, I mean, this links to the uh, Tamil population in South India. Uh, and uh, how the Tamil population in South India weaves the developments in Sri Lanka and so on. So, uh, when you really think about it, the, the pressure that comes from India is actually pressure that, is, that, that originates uh, somewhere else, not in the central government, but uh, in the southern part of uh, India. Uh, and in a sense, it's understandable. Uh, and and as, long it, as long as India is next to Sri Lanka, uh, 
this will be the case. Uh, but it's also interesting that you know no power, no uh, country, no state uh, can be considered to be genuinely interested in any uh, domestic problem in any uh, other part of the world. Um, so uh, sort of critiquing these, these actors as not so genuine actors uh, having vested interests and so on uh, does not take one very far because that's how states operate. Uh, and what's also interesting is that even though uh, actors like India have been pushing for power sharing uh, uh, and so on in, in Sri Lanka, uh, they themselves have been unable to address some of the problems that they've had. I mean, take Kashmir, for example. Uh, uh, even in the 80s, even when India was intervening very heavily in Sri Lankan matters, uh, they were adopting policies which uh, denied the freedom to the Kashmiri people in the 80s, 87, 89, and so on. So uh, you see that hypocrisy uh, very clearly. Uh, but what needs to be done from a local perspective is to just leave that aside and focus on, on, on uh, your problem, the problem that you are confronted with, uh, and try to address that problem because ultimately it's about uh, equality uh, and, and power of the people. And that's a matter that needs to be addressed, irrespective of whether uh, you have you know, uh, external sort of influences, threats, and so on uh, going around you. Thank you. So we, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the demands, the opportunities, and the challenges, but looking at it in from a futuristic perspective. Where is Sri Lanka going? What are we going to have to address in the years and decades ahead? When we come back, with the Sri Lankan understanding. Welcome back to the Sri Lankan understanding. We're talking to Dr. Kalanasena Ratna about power sharing, demands, opportunities, and challenges. Kalana, going back to um, your experience, You've worked with a Sri Lankan who has reached the highest level that any Sri Lankan has reached in the legal fraternity in the world. Uh, the late esteemed judge C.G. Viramantri was the vice president of the International Court of Justice. Uh, he has made some landmark rulings in some of uh, the cases that he has heard. Power sharing, in terms of how he looked at it, how he trained you or guided you in looking at it, or guided us in looking at it. Where are we today? What have we learned from him and that vision that he had? Uh, that's a very interesting question, uh, George, because Judge Viramantri, uh, perhaps a lot of people don't know this, he was, he talked about power sharing uh, when he was not in Sri Lanka. He had left Sri Lanka, he had been the uh, judge of the Supreme Court. Uh, he was uh, now the uh, uh, professor of law at uh, uh, Monash. Uh, so he approached this topic of power sharing from a critical perspective, especially territorial power sharing, uh, because he was uh, not so keen on, on seeing Sri Lanka as, as a federal state. Uh, so he was critical of, of, of the attempt that was made at that time, uh, also because of Indian influence and so on, uh, of this topic of federalism. Um, but there's a different type of power sharing, another type of power sharing. Uh, which is non-territorial. And I think on, on that particular issue, he was quite strong for uh, equality of peoples, um, which is why he, uh, even though he was uh, somewhat critical of, of uh, power sharing at the territorial level, he talked about the importance of human rights protection, uh, about independent institutions, uh, of uh, true equality uh, of, of various groups, uh, and so on. So. What I learned from Judge Veera Mantri is, is largely this, this idea that you can be uh, you know, a very humane sort of individual uh, and you can even be uh, for or against a unitary state. I mean, this is the debate that we, that we are having today. You can be for un a unitary state, a federal state or whatever, but still there could be certain basic principles that you uh, uh, hold on to. Uh, one being uh, equality, non-discrimination, um, uh, the need to uh, uh, recognize uh, the different uh, 
uh, demands made by various other groups in society. These are some of the core principles that Judge Veeramantri sort of brought out in his writings. Um, so, uh, uh, what I don't see, unfortunately, uh, especially by uh, people who uh, are for a unitary state, uh, is this other dimension, this, this uh, aspect of promoting greater equality, at least through non-territorial uh, mechanisms. Uh, and that's very unfortunate. That's why I think a lot of people have not, uh, are not unitarist in, in, in the way that Judge Veera Mantri or a person like him was. In terms of that vision that he had internationally and also for Sri Lanka, where do you see us going in the future? Where do you see us in the next five years or ten years? Whether we want to talk about it as an opportunity or a challenge, yeah. What do you see as the future of this whole concept? Are we devolving? Are we not devolving? Where are we going? How, how will things play out? Concerns that you may have at this stage? Uh, I don't... I mean, let me give an answer like this, uh, George. Uh, this might sound controversial, but, but this is... I mean, to me, this is quite mundane, actually. So, from a spiritual sense, I think um, these kinds of problems uh, cannot be easily addressed, or I don't think they get resolved. And the basic reason why that, that, that is the case is because the moment we divide ourselves uh, based on ethnicity, religion, whatever, uh, on schools, you know, our school identity, uh, even within schools we have different identities, I mean, uh, uh, we belong to certain houses, so on and so forth. Um, wherever you see a group of people divided on any line, uh, in that division you get the root of the problem, uh, which cannot be resolved. Because there will come a time when that particular group he, who, who believes that he or she belongs to a particular identity uh, needs to defend itself. Right? Uh, and you would adopt positions which go against the rights, the freedom, the liberties, the security of some other group. Uh, so in a spiritual sense, these problems cannot be addressed. But politically, what you're talking about here is coming up with the right kind of compromise. Uh, and and uh, for me personally, I mean, I would uh, prefer a solution uh, or at least a, a political system where power is devolved extensively to other groups of people. Um, is that possible? Um, well, the way things are going today, uh, I mean, I don't see any 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 uh, hope of, of something like that happening. Um, and I think for the next 10, 15, 20 years, it is going to be a difficult sort of struggle. Uh, because the Sri Lankan state, not really, this is not really about the people, but the state in general, uh, the different institutions, judiciary, so on and so forth, uh, they have a particular mindset about uh, devolution. They have a particular approach that they adopt. Um, which is anti-devolutionary, uh, quite unfortunately. So therefore, uh, these are developments, uh, or developments with regard to greater power sharing, are things that uh, might not happen, given the political sort of environment that we are living in. But then what we can do, of course, is to talk about this, uh, especially with the youth, and I think that's where um, uh, a lot of potential lies, where you talk to the youth, the students, uh, children in, in school and so on, and to get them to think more broadly about all of this um, without promoting this or that solution, um, to get them to talk more broadly and see, you know, uh, how another community, another identity would think uh, about these matters. Um, and that's perhaps the only, perhaps worthwhile thing that some of us in, in academia and so on uh, can think of doing. That's a very wonderful point that you bring us as we wrap up today's episode. Because one thing that we probably got to start looking at the bigger picture, Kalana, is we demand rights. We're forgetting the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And this is where Sri Lankans as a whole, we have a label. You talked about the different categories, whether it's amongst the communities or whether it's amongst the schools or whether it's within the schools. And we, we, we can find lots of things that are going to divide us. Yeah. We've got to start looking for things that are going to unite us. And that's that Sri Lankan identity, which we've got to start focusing on. So that's where we wrap up today's session of the Sri Lankan Understanding. Thank you very much for joining us. We've had Dr. Kalana Senaratna talking to us about power sharing. We've looked at historic demands, missed opportunities, 
and contemporary challenges. Join us again on the Sri Lankan understanding as we explore the path this country has taken and try to identify the potential for the future. Thank you.